Once again, good morning to everybody who's joining us for worship, whether you're with us live or you're joining us later. We're very happy that you are worshiping with us today. Grateful to have you as part of our community. If you would just take a few moments now in quiet to invite the Holy Spirit to join you as you worship in your home, if you have a practice of lighting a candle or any other practice to set this aside as a time of prayer, I encourage you to do that at this time. Blessed is our Father, Lord of heaven and earth, who has revealed these things to the simple. Oh, come, let us worship. Dear friends in Christ, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Please join in singing our invitatory hymn. gradual this morning is taken not from the book of Psalms, but rather from the Song of Solomon. We will read it responsibly by whole verse. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes. Leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall. Gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. 
they and give forth fragrance. fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father, Father, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and, and will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on the account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites now come to me. I have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Go and assemble the elders of Israel, and say to them, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have given heed to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. I declare that I will bring you up out of the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. They will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us now go a three days journey into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. I know, however, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders that I will perform in it. After that, he will let you go. I will bring this people into such favor with the Egyptians that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. Each woman shall ask her neighbor and any woman living in the neighbor's house for jewelry of silver and of gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and so you shall plunder the Egyptians. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join in singing our gospel hymn, Hear the Call of the Kingdom.
the Holy Gospel of Matthew. Lord be with you. And also with you. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We play the flute for you, and you do not dance. We wail, and you do not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, He has a demon, the son of man, came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by his deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me. All you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for our, your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Okay, I speak to you today in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hello, Good Shepherd. Thank you so much for welcoming me here today and to your gathering. I am so happy to be with you. I wish we could chat over coffee after, um, but honestly, I don't think I ever felt this meeting that had such nice energy to it. Uh, so I already feel like I'm getting a bit of a taste of what your community is like. As a lady reader, I'm always excited to get a chance to preach. Hmm. And I'm excited especially excited to have a chance to preach about calling or the call of Moses today. The question of what our calling is, is kind of a huge and complicated one. And it's kind of funny that in my life, I've mostly heard about it from priests, which nothing against priests, great people, um, but of all the people I've met, they have the most clear and confident sense of Sorry about that, everybody. Um, Allison is gonna try and leave and come back. I don't know what's going on with her internet. I was able to hear her, she was just slow. And it sounded a little pixelated. But uh, she's left and she's come back. So let's see if uh, this works now. Better now? A little bit. I'm going to text my husband in the other room and tell him to stop using internet. That <laughs> like a plan. See if that helps. Sorry. No worries. All right. So Allison is going to check on her internet just for a second. We will all just take a deep breath and think about the calling of Moses.
Am I kind of breaking up? Yeah, you are. Do you want to try turning your video off and seeing if audio makes you sound better? Do I sound better now? Yeah, you do. You sound better now. You give me one second. I'll be right back. Is that okay? Sorry. No worries. Hey everyone, sorry about that. They are not even on Netflix, so I have nobody to blame this on. But do I sound okay now, Jordan? Yeah, you, you sound okay. <sighs> I'm thinking my connection is unstable. Sorry. Uh, well, take two. I speak today, today in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you for inviting to your gathering. Thank you for putting up with my uh, computer hiccups. I'm happy to be here with you. I wish we could chat over coffee after. I see a lot of kind of, am I still sounding that way or no? Thumbs up if I'm all right. It's kind of, it's kind of mixed, honestly. Sometimes you sound okay and then it'll go away for a little bit. I guess I'll just forge ahead, Jordan. Yeah, forge ahead, and if it gets to be too bad. I don't know what to do. I'm sorry. No. Hmm. Okay. Jordan, can uh, Okay. So as a lead reader, I'm always really excited to get an opportunity to preach. And I'm especially excited excited to get an opportunity to preach about the call of Moses today. The question of what our calling is, is such a huge and complicated one. And it's funny to me that in my life, I've mostly heard about it from priests, which nothing against priests, obviously they are fantastic people. But of all the people I've met, they have the most clear and confident sense of call. When I hear them speak on the topic of calling, I admire their passion and I envy their clarity, but I often kind of struggle to relate. In my job, I work at McEwen, I process student loan approvals and scholarship applications. And it has its interesting pieces, but I doubt anyone would consider processing complicated spreadsheets a calling. I'm a typical millennial. I have bailed on two potential career paths already, and I'm only 35. I gave up on my dream of being a professor before I even finished my PhD. And I took a few steps down. When Sue, our priest at Christ Church, described your calling as a place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger, <laughs> not necessarily my life. But then there, you want me to start? Yeah, sorry about this, Allison. Uh, but yeah, if you want to just send me a file, I can uh, I can read this for folks because everybody can hear me, right? 
seeing some nods. Sorry, I have been so looking forward to this. I'm really sorry. But yeah, if you want to just send the file my way, either through Zoom or uh, email or Facebook, I'll email you for you. I am impressed though, that we have been doing Zoom worship for over three months and this is the first major <laughs> that we've ever had. So it was bound to happen. We've been courting danger for the last long little time. And uh, I'm just only sorry that it's happened on this Sunday when Allison is with us. Okie dokie. Thanks everybody for your patience. I appreciate all of you. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm reading Allison's words. This is her sermon. This is not from me, but I will, uh, I'll read it to you. It's uh, going to be particularly interesting because uh, <laughs> she's talking about her experience as a lay reader. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll begin again. Allison says, Hi there, well, thank you for welcoming me into your gathering. I am so happy to be here with you today and I wish that we could chat over coffee afterwards. As a lay reader, I am always excited to get a chance to preach. And I'm especially excited to speak about the call of Moses today. The question of what our calling is, is such a huge and complicated one. And it's funny to me that in my life, I've mostly heard it discussed by priests. Nothing against priests, obviously, but of all the people I've met, they have the most clear and confident sense of call. When I hear them speak on the topic of calling, I admire their passion and envy their clarity and often just cannot relate at all. In my job, I process student loan approvals and scholarship applications. It has its interesting pieces, but I doubt anyone would consider processing complicated spreadsheets a calling. As a typical millennial, by the age of 35, I've already given up on two potential career paths. I gave up on my dream of being a professor before I'd even finished my PhD. And I took a few steps down the path to ordained priesthood before discerning it wasn't me. When Sue, our priest at Christ Church, describes one's calling as the place where your greatest hunger and the world's deepest need meet, I think about my spreadsheets and think, okay, not my life. But then there are the parts of my life where I do have that clarity. My call to be a parent, my call to follow Jesus, although that one has its own rocky road that I can tell you about another day. I don't have a calling as a career. But I certainly feel like God has placed certain desires in my heart. And like God sometimes nudges and sometimes shoves me down specific paths. If I had that chance to share a copy with you, I am sure that in this gathering, there are a wide range of feelings and experiences around the question of calling. I am sure that some of you are as committed to your calling, whatever it is, as Reverend Jordan is to hers. And I'm sure that at least one person would pull me aside and quietly admit that they're just as muddled as I am. And into this range of experiences this morning walks Moses, one of the great leaders in our history, hearing the voice of God from a miraculous burning bush calling him to take on a task 
of epic complexity. So how do we, some of us who feel a calling, some of us who don't, probably many of us who wander around in the gray area in between, make sense of our relationship to this text? I think I get stuck on the topic of calling because I immediately jump to fretting over my calling, whether I've found it, whether I'm fulfilling it, whether I should do more. And really, much as God loves each and every one of us gathered here, the focus of God's story in the Bible is the healing and redemption of the whole world. It is our calling into relationship with God and each other. I think the way open, forward opens up when, instead of thinking of this as the call of Moses, we think of it as one more stage in God's call to Israel, and by extension, God's call to all God's people. God's never-ending, over and over, tireless work of raising us out of darkness and gathering us into the light of God's kingdom. And the beautiful thing is that this shift in perspective from focusing on the individual to focusing on the community isn't something that I have to project onto the text this morning. It's sitting right there in chapter three of Exodus. Moses gets charged by God with a challenging and terrifying task. And the conversation between Moses and God has very little to do with Moses as an individual and much more to do with relationships. The relationships between God, Moses, and the people of Israel. Moses' first question is about understanding himself. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? We can hear this question as worrying that he's not good enough to take on the task, but also as wondering if there's a part of himself that he doesn't understand yet. Who am I? God's answer is simple, but perhaps unexpected. I will be with you. He doesn't reassure Moses that Moses is up to the task or explain why he's the person for the job. Instead, he cuts through Moses' worries and questions by stripping things down to the essentials. Moses is a child of God, and God is present with Moses. This relationship is what qualifies Moses to participate in the unfolding of God's redemptive work. It's also the answer to Moses' deeper questions about his identity. Who is he? He is with God. That relationship is at the core of his being. But it doesn't stop with God and Moses. There's the small matter of the entire nation of oppressed people who God is asking Moses to lead into freedom. And so Moses presses on. If I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask what is his name, what shall I say to them? If Moses' first question is, who am I? His second one is more or less, who are you? What's your name? But it's a bit more complex than that. It's who should I tell the Israelites that you are? How do I forge the connection between you and your people? Or maybe, how do I name you correctly so that they see me and understand me to be one of their own? The question is about the relationship not just between Moses and God or between Moses and the Israelites or God and the Israelites for that matter. It's about the relationship between all three. My therapist likes to remind me that the commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself has these same three components, God, self, and neighbor. You can't try to love God and yourself while hating your neighbor or love yourself and your neighbor while leaving God out of the equation. And trying to love God and your neighbor while hating yourself is a hard road to walk. You need all three pieces, like three legs on a stool. Remove any one of them and the whole thing topples over. We are created to be in relationship with each other, 
None of us was made to go through life alone. And God has given us a beautiful, endless range of ways to connect with each other. Being brothers and sisters in Christ, putting up with our literal sisters and brothers as we grow together, being neighbors, friends, partners, parents, joining in solidarity through community work, struggles for justice, and shared service. The work of God does not stop at my story or your story, but our story. When God shows us what God is like through the Bible, we see that relationship is at the very heart of God's being as well as ours. Before all things, God was already not alone. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Spirit moved on the face of the waters. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, Abba, Christ, and Holy Ghost, or as I once heard Jordan say, two dudes and a bird. As history moves forward, we still see God explaining themselves in terms of relationship here in Exodus. Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Say to the Israelites, your people knew me. I have been with you, and I still am. Say to the Israelites, we already know each other. We are already part of the same story. So what does it look like to try and be more like Moses? Not by going off on some grand heroic quest or parting the Red Sea, but by asking how we relate to God, to ourselves, and to each other. We may need to unlearn some bad habits first. Habits of reading everything in terms of our own personal story. We are so steeped in a culture that glorifies individualism, mavericks, heroes, innovators, and lone warriors that it can be hard to reframe our identity in terms of our dependence on God and each other. I was part of a small weekly service for a number of years and we had one quiet young man who came for several weeks and didn't say much. Then one week, the sermon was about how we need to lean on our community and how the Bible shows us that we cannot go it alone. The young man sat up, interrupted the sermon, and informed the preacher that he was wrong. I am the hero of my story, he said. I am the hero of my story. And then he never came back to another service. Preacher Erna Kim Hackett has some excellent insight into how this individualist view limits our ability to join together and work for justice. Writing from her perspective as an American and a self-described woman of color, she says, though there is a place for the individual in theology, white American culture has distorted the Bible to be solely about individual redemption. So it is blind to the reality that when scripture says, I know the plans I have for you, the you is plural and addressed to an entire community of people that has been displaced and are in exile. All scripture has been reduced to individual interactions between God and a person, even when they are actually between God and a community, or Jesus and a group of people. This approach, says Hackett, cannot comprehend communal, systemic, or institutionalized sin like the sins of racism or other sins of exclusion and oppression, because it has erased all examples of that framework from scripture. Hackett memorably calls this focus on the individual Disney princess theology. As each individual reads scripture, they see themselves as the princess in every story. They are Esther, never Xerxes or Haman. They are Peter, but never Judas. They are the woman anointing Jesus, never the Pharisees. They are the Jews escaping slavery, never Egypt. So here's my suggestion for us as we continue through Exodus. Let's try imagining what God's call to Israel felt like from different perspectives in the story. 
How are we Moses? Who are we being called into relationship with? How do we need to relearn our identity as people of God? But also, how are we like Pharaoh? Whose freedom are we standing in the way of? Whose oppression do we benefit from? And how are we like Miriam? How do we express our feelings of joy and how do we communicate them to our people? Let's take some time to look at God's great story as the story of a community and a people rather than the story of a heroic leader. I'm spending way, way too much time on Facebook lately, and last week my feed was full of a new music video. The Dixie Chicks had just dropped Dixie from their name and released a song in March. March with a powerful video celebrating struggles for justice, from the fight for women's voices to Black Lives Matter. The song is almost intolerably catchy, and I've had the chorus stuck in my head for days. March. March to my own drum. March, march to my own drum. Hey, I'm an army of one. Yeah, I'm an army of one. But that's not what the music video shows. Nobody is marching alone. Nobody is following their own drum or trying to fight the good fight single-handedly. They are finding common ground, shared points of their stories, and joining together to try and build a common future with broader justice and more inclusive community. We do not march to our own drum. We march to the heartbeat of God that brings life to the whole world. We march to hymns that we have sung so many years they are part of the air we breathe. We march alongside each other, brother and sister, neighbor and stranger, because we know that God will not let one lamb go missing. Our way forward is together, self, neighbor, and God. So when we think about, pray about, test out ideas about how we think God wants us to participate in the making whole of humanity, let's be like Moses. Let's ask ourselves, who am I? Who is God? And who is God calling me into relationship with? How will we recognize each other? How will we greet each other? How will we draw together in the shared knowledge of who we belong to? The answer can only be beautiful. Amen. Thank you, Allison, for those beautiful words and for sharing them with us. Our worship continues now as we affirm our faith using the words of the Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us pray with confidence to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. O Lord, Guard and direct your church in the way of unity, service, and praise. Lord, hear our prayer. Give to all nations an awareness of the unity of the human family. Lord, hear our prayer. Cleanse our hearts of prejudice and selfishness and inspire us to hunger and thirst for what is right. Lord, hear our prayer. It's thinking. Teach us to use your creation for your greater praise, that all may share the good things you provide. Lord, hear our prayer. 
Strengthen all who give their energy or skill for the healing of those who are sick in body or in mind. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Set free all who are bound by fear and despair. Lord, hear Lord, our prayer. Grant a peaceful end and eternal rest to all who are dying and your comfort to those who mourn. Lord, hear our prayer. Father of light, yours is the morning and yours is the evening. Let Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine forever in our hearts and draw us to that light where you live in radiant glory. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, has taught us that what we do for the least of your children, we do also for him. Give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all who gave up his life and died for us, but lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks everyone for hanging with us during that technical difficulty. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm grateful too to Allison for giving us those beautiful words this morning. Um, what a treat to hear an additional perspective on the call of Moses. Um, I certainly learned a lot, and I hope that you did too. A couple of quick announcements. As I mentioned before we got started, uh, starting immediately after this service, I'm on vacation. Uh, I am in town if there's an emergency, but I am not working. Uh, if you have pastoral emergencies, please call Reverend Tom. He is happy to be here for you. Um, you will, he and Reverend Maud will be leading worship. They will be continue. The daily group is continuing. Everything is going to happen. You don't need me for everything that we do to continue. Um, so everybody should have Zoom passwords and everything that they need. So we will keep going as a church. Um, and I, while I am on holiday. Uh, Nadia has graciously agreed to convene another gathering for our members of color. This will be July 14th at 5.30 p.m. So if you missed the first one or if you have more stories that you'd like to share, you are more than welcome to join them for that. When I come back on July 22nd, we'll have another gathering for story sharing that is intended for people who have not experienced racism themselves, but intend to be allies in the work. And then we'll have another one that is intended to be for everybody. So we are gathering uh, all kinds of groups. I'm seeing some chat notifications. Hold on. All right, making sure. Oh, Mary's saying she's got a birthday. So we'll make sure that we bless Mary for her birthday um, he, once we get to the birthday blessing. Um, let's see, other announcements. Our new parish administrator just got started. Please do send her an email, welcome her. It's hard to start a new job working from home in the middle of this COVID stuff. So uh, if you would welcome her so that she knows uh, that she is welcome and included and part of our community, that would be really great. Please also be nice to her if the weekly roundup in the next couple of weeks, if there's mistakes or, or formatting problems, uh, please chalk it up to be my fault that I didn't leave her clear enough instructions and not her fault. So uh, if there's a problem with the weekly roundup, uh, it's on me, okay? Um, let's see, Mary's got a birthday. Any other birthdays or anniversaries? Oh, one final announcement. Oh, Paul is saying the Bella's birthday is coming up. So we've got two birthday blessings to do. But before we do, um, the bishop has approved our plan with minimal comment. So um, we will not plan to have a Sunday in-person service for some time, probably not until September, but we are working on uh, enacting the plan that uh, the bishop has approved. And the thing I can announce now is save the date for August 8th, that's a Saturday. We're gonna have an open house um, I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work yet. One idea that's been proposed is that we'll uh, assign you kind of some windows 
that you can come and you can see what the church looks like. You can check out our safety measures. You can measure your own risk. Um, decide how you feel about them before we come back in early September. So uh, we might do a couple midweek things between the open house and our first big Sunday service, but um, the main date to keep on your calendar is August 8th for our open house. And then um, we're still watching our case counts, we're still checking on everything, but uh, we will keep you informed, um, save the date for August 8th. All right, so let's see, I've got three birthdays showing up in the chat. Mary. Bella and Marguerite, anybody else got a birthday that needs a blessing? All right, well, let us pray. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and teach them to trust in your goodness all the days of their lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty be upon the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. We come now into our time of offertory. Thank you to everyone who continues to support the mission of Good Shepherd financially. We're so grateful to you. Um, as you know, in this time, it is very challenging to continue the work that we have to do as we plan to reopen. We're doing things like buying touchless faucets and sanitizer stations. Uh, we're working very hard to make the church safe. And we can only do that because of your financial support. So thank you to everyone who has continued your pledge, everyone who has increased your pledge. You are just our heroes. And uh, that is very much a part of God's calling to our community. So thank you so much. Whether you donate during the hymn which follows or if you donate at another time, know that the prayer which follows, we will dedicate your gift to God. Now please join in singing our offertory hymn, 10,000.
God of heaven and earth, receive our sacrifice of praise and strengthen us for the perfect freedom of your service through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the God who shakes heaven and earth, whom death could not contain, who lives to disturb and heal us, bless you with power to go forth and proclaim the gospel. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Please join in singing our sending hymn, Cry of My Heart. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.